doing tonight? My name is Ped Killer. Tonight we're going to be doing a second round. As you all know, probably, well, if you don't know, I probably should not assume that you all know. But second round is the stream where we go and talk about... Um, we basically talk about topics that we didn't get to fully explore on the Drunk Splaining po uh, podcast. And, um, or, you know, I, or just renditions of my thoughts, um, and just kind of further going soberly into those topics. <clears throat> All right. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Oh, there we are. Hey. All right. So, today, um, ooh, let's adjust that camera just a smidge. Much better. Okay. Um, so, uh, today's topics that we're going to be talking about, we're uh, going to be touching back on uh, space travel. Um, and all of these are from the most previous episode of Drunk Splaining. Uh, Drunk Splaining episode 6, I believe it is. Um, these, uh, so, uh, um, and that's, that's where all these are going to be drawn from. So, instead of me just regurgitating each one, we'll just go ahead and bam, 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 bam. So, uh, first we're going to be talking about space travel, kind of our limitations, and kind of retouching about what we talked about with the idea of the great filter and all that fun stuff. Um, we also got, I'm going to touch back on the education system. I know I've tried to touch on this a couple times, I believe in episode three or episode four. We also kind of touched on it barely, but we're going to go ahead and try, uh, have to have a good go at it again. Um, we also, uh, this wasn't an actual topic. It was just an offshoot conversation that happened organically. Um, and this is, uh, about... I'm going to give my thoughts about why I think the U.S. is, is such a, a great goddamn place to live. Um, and then finally, we're going to touch on, uh, it was the final topic of the night, uh, fitting, huh? Huh? Okay. Well, we were going to touch on the few, uh, the, uh, the last topic of the night, which was, uh, addressing future hostilities and how that would work if, uh, a lot of these, uh, kind of sci-fi-esque, um, realities were to happen. Um, so yeah, fun. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so first, first things first, uh, uh was space travel. So, uh, we kind of touched on this, uh, beforehand, um, uh, on the drunk splaining. I think I did at least did a decent enough job, but, um, there's a concept out there called the great filters. And the great filters are uh, what life has to go through to um, reach the next to reach the next stage of life, right? So you have the filter of actually just becoming organic, an organic going from organic molecules to um, a living, uh, an actual living cell, right? That's a filter because during because there's a lot that can go wrong during that process. And each filter doesn't have to be anything of of uh, doesn't have to be anything of normal, you know, stop or stoppages. Like I guess what way we think of um, that comes off the hand is overhunting, disease, whatever. It can be something as your star system just went supernova, or your planet due to some large astral body was flung out of the solar system. Now it's froze over. Any organic molecules are now dead, you know, are now inert. So there's many different things that can impact these great filters. So, you know, you have filters like becoming organic, an organic, uh, an actual living thing. Then you go into, um, uh, becoming, uh, cellular and becoming self-sufficient and then becoming, you know, uh, mobile and I think I'm going way too in depth with this. So let's just keep it simple um, and just say complex life or multicellular life, complex life, and then you know nervous systems, and then 
you know, all the way up until you get this, until you reach the filter of sentiency. And so far, on our planet, only one species has passed through that filter that we know of anyway. Who knows? There are going to be lizard people at the center of the earth. Who the fuck knows? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, but, okay, well, so we do have, we do see animals that do possess almost human intellect. I mean, bonobos, chimps, dolphins. Um, I even think some octopi have you know, varying levels of intelligence that we could equate to human ears. Like they say, dogs have an intelligence of a four-year-old. So keep that in mind. Um, But then you have your transition to civilization. Um, Well, actually, again, I misspeak. There's quite a few. There's quite a few species that actually became, um, that were sentient. We have Cro-Magnon, uh, we have Neanderthal, um, Homo habilis, and many of these other um, great apes that died out, and they never got to cross that next next filter, which is civilizations. Whether they be, um, you know, something simple like small farming villages or whatever, or something as complex, or even not even farming villages, hunter gatherer societies. Um, but something something uh, beyond just making simple tools, something beyond just, you know, um, roaming together as a family unit, right? You had a layered, complex society form that had its own culture. It could create its own art, its own goods. Um, so... Then there was, you know, other filters, you know, and I, the right now, though, the great filter that we're up against right now is space travel, the ability to leave our home world. Um, so right now, the barriers in our way, you know, I some, you know, some people have said that, oh, we've already passed it because we've been on the moon. But I really don't think we have. I think we've kind of butted up against the filter, put our hands up there, and we're are, are trying to push through. We have a lot of barriers in our way. So right now, one of the biggest one of the biggest barriers in our way is a lack of investment. We have not put as a species a large effort into going to space. Sure. As soon as we figured out that there were some things that we could easily do to take advantage of it, we capitalize on on that and we move on. The moon didn't provide us with what we wanted, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, You know, there's there's nothing up there. And we've also all signed international treaties saying that we can't, you know, put a moon base up there. So... There's no real reason to go up there. There's no real reason to move forward. Found out that Mars is pre- pretty much uninhabitable. Um, there's no way you can terraform it to be like Earth. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's because there's no way of maintaining an atmosphere on Mars. Um, it, so what planets do um, to uh, when they have atmospheres... Um, They also have, in their core, a spinning iron um, ball of a core surrounded by molten iron. And this spinning core generates a magnetic field around the planet, which which ceases or or prevents the solar winds from blowing away away the atmosphere. Uh, Mars doesn't have that. Mars actually is pretty much solid all the way through. And because of that, it either has no magnetic field or has an extremely weak magnetic field, and weak enough that the uh, that most of the atmosphere gets blown away by the solar winds. Um, this means no matter how much greenhouse gases we pump into the atmosphere of Mars, there's no way we could ever terraform it. And and uh, that's kind of what I was talking about is that you know. Mars is kind of not really an option um, because to make a colony sustainable, it would have to be self-sufficient. 
You can't just constantly keep pumping supplies up there because as soon as you stop, even even just delay, it could be a bloody death sentence to those people. And then your colony has been flushed down the toilet. You have to have some viability and sustainability for your colony. Um, and that's kind of where we're talking about microenvironments, right, and asteroids. Um, sure, could we do that in Mars? Maybe. Um, so far, we haven't seen the evidence of, of being able to do that. But sure, okay, we could probably duck, tunnel underground. Um, but a big problem I didn't address with those mi- with, with those kind of microenvironments is, is you're still basically living in an environment completely devoid of sunlight, completely devoid of... You know, you're in an enclosed environment at all times. We don't know what psychological damage that could do to somebody over a long period of time. You know, um, so there's no real, there's no real uh, investment towards going into space. And I think that's going to bite us in the ass. I think this is something that we, as an entire United Species, need to be pushing towards so that way one day we can escape this rock and i mean think not not just escape it but to bring resources back to to expand our abilities um also another barrier is that we are non a non our planet doesn't have a unified government and we can say this is good or bad this is a very very hot topic but a unified solid effort that could devote devote resources instead of worrying about being stabbed in the back by the next person behind next country over it would allow you to devote a lot of your resources to getting to space flight to getting out there and it's kind of like, at, at, at the end of the day, whether regardless of how that this unification comes, whether it's from military conquest, whether it's for everybody just coming together, singing kumbaya, you know, it or just deciding, you know what, out there in the out there in the void is way fucking scarier than whatever we could do to each other, or preferably we all decide to get the hell over ourselves. And just decide to work towards something better than ourselves. We could finally put all those resources and that manpower to getting into space sustainably. And that brings me into my next topic or the next point here. You know, we're too busy as a society on regressing society. We're too busy trying to tear down everything that's been built up. On the on the heels of some of the greatest technological innovation in the world, the world has ever seen, we are we are decide we are defiant in the fact that we are going to damn well ensure that we're going to flush all this down the shitter and usher in a new dark age. And this is on the back of of honestly, I mean. If you want to say, if you want to stick to the realm of politics, fine. We can relate it on political lines. The right side of the aisle is complacent and letting it happen because compromise is better, right? And the left is like, nope, put the, put the pedal on the fucking accelerator and let's coast right off that fucking edge. This is, and this is the problem. We're a society of complacency. You know, we're a society who has gotten too soft and we've realized that there is no challenge. So we have to seek challenge in ourselves to validate our own existence. And that's going to bite us in the ass. I don't know what would happen if we got put into another dark age. I mean, right now... The, the left side of the aisle is damn well trying to turn science into a new religion and to completely subvert the scientific method all at the same time. And I'm like, bloody hell. Like, it's just sad. So where do we go from here? 
You know, it's it's very difficult. I think what private people like Elon Musk and the like who are trying to use their own wealth and and advancements to get into space is a step in the right direction. But right now, you know, we're we're butted up against that filter and I don't I I don't know if we're going to pass through it. I don't know. You know, we end up may end up throwing ourselves into another dark age and then coming up against a, a threat in which our, our dark age riddled asses can't deal with. Who knows? All right, so our next topic is the education system. Um, so the biggest problem, um, and this has been a problem since, uh, I mean, Dang nabbit, it, it's been a problem forever. Forever in a, in a, in a bloody day. Um, and, you know, we can talk about problems like, you know, No Child Left Behind um, and other things, you know, that, that that basically resulted in teachers teaching the test. And yes, that is a bad, a bad, it, it is a horrible, bad thing. But these, these, uh, these things kind of, uh, kind of, are just a part of the problem. There, there's more, more. Uh, there's more to it. You know, I've known quite a few teachers in my day and in my time here on the planet Earth. And one thing that I've always seen in every single school district that I've vis- visited, whether it be in Kansas, um, whether it be uh, in, I think I've seen them in Colorado and um, on the east and West Coast, especially in California, um, in Nebraska, the, the, the places that I've seen, or at least gotten insight into, the thing that's always constant is bad teachers are always rewarded. And I say rewarded as, let me use my, my, my phraseology. If you do something shitty and you're allowed to keep doing it, then I see that as a reward. You're getting a big ass gift from that administration who's saying, yes, continue to be garbage. You know? And the whole process, whether you want to start with the, uh, the, the teachers' unions or the way the school administrations work, um, and even, you know, deficits of resources, whatever, it also demotivates the good teachers. The teachers can't teach their their subject how they want to or how they, they need to. A lot of these school systems end up teaching the test, and it's sad. It really is. It's very sad. Um, or they end up, you know, p- trying to pump up, you know, some the, basically the school's ego. That was a big problem with my school once I left. Uh, my brother told me, or my brother and quite a few others who, you know, went there afterwards were like, yeah. In fact, it got so bad, they changed their school colors to incorporate the blue fucking ribbon that they get for high educational standards. And, I, and I'll tell you this much, my ass came out of the school. I mean, <laughs> okay, well, I am, I, am, I am smart, but that's because I went out of my way, all right? I went out of my way to learn. I, I taught myself a lot of things, and... When I was a young man, I decided to walk a path that had me learning a lot. But, you know, a lot of people came out of there didn't have that lust for knowledge. And, you know, it, it I mean, it, it is just that. It's an over, uh, it's an over sense of, uh, an over bloated ego. Um... But speaking of things being bloated, you all you also have a bloated bureaucracy, redundant you know positions, people who really don't need to be in a certain spe- spe- specific position, and many bureaucrats to do to oversee you know way fewer teachers. In fact, you know just by cutting out the Department of Edu- the Federal Department of Education. You know, you would probably be able to spread that money around a lot better 
pay teachers more and be able to actually provide resources that can help these students. But I also don't, don't believe that it is always a funding thing because we've increased funding for schools for years. For years. You know? And the more money we pump into this bloated bureaucracy, it doesn't matter. We don't see a difference. And why is that? Why is it that charter schools and like private schools can you or take in so much less money per student, per student, right? Invest so little per, so, or so much less per student and come up with the same results. Why is that? You know, that, that's something we need to, but we need to be asking. But no, if we, if we dare ask questions about that, we, we, we don't want to educate children. We want them to be dumb and stupid. No, motherfucker. I want them to get a good ass education. And then the, the last, the last problem is all the social engineering and the bad mental health practices. You know, I will say it once. I will say it again. You know, I the, the way mental health was taught in my school was don't fucking talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. You know, just stop complaining. You're getting bullied. Change. That way they won't bully you anymore. It's your problem that you're being bullied. There's also social engineering. I mean, teaching us history that favors one particular side of the aisle and always favors the government. Like, they still teach, they taught that that government is basically what got us out of the Great uh, Great Depression with, like, the uh, New Deal and uh, uh, some of the other policies that were put out there, all the jobs programs and whatnot. And it's like, hold up, didn't that extend the Great Depression longer than it probably should have been? Wasn't it, you know, the advent of, you know, entre- or the, wasn't it increased entrepreneurship and the advent of some technologies in which bo- boosted us out of there, you know? And wasn't it the recovery of, you know, actual sustainable farming practices that helped in the Dust Bowl, you know? But we're just taught it was government saved us. And they teach kids to be compliant to not be creative to not think outside the box and you know i'll have to find the video for you one day you know especially for men, for for boys and and males you know the classroom isn't designed for a male student which i know a lot of feminists out there are gonna be like wow no it's all male dominant no it's not classrooms are designed to adv- advantage females and, that, and that's fine, but we need to find a way that we can spur more male interest in education. And that kind of flows into the next thing is critical race theory. You know, I can't tell you how many people that I've met who have kids who are having breakdowns because they think that either that somebody's out, to, some invisible force of people are out there to get them, or that they are somehow compelled by genetics to go and hurt people, hurt their friends. You know, I've talked about on, I've talked, you know, on end about this, and, you know, it's wrong. It's wrong, right? You know, the first time that I actually found out there was a difference between, which, which is bullshit, by the way, which is bullshit, right? But that I was made aware that there was differences between me and my, we'll say, African American classmates, or my, um, or my Latino classmates, or my gay classmates, or whatever, was when they the 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 stu or the uh, the faculty and staff body went out of their way to point it out. We peacefully coexisted, all of us. Like, until somebody was like, let's put a bullhorn on this. You know, it's like, why? We're fine. Maybe one or two backwards idiots who rightly got the shit kicked out of them for saying something 
or for, I think one of them called somebody, you know, a gay slur, and another one called somebody uh, some derogatory term for Latino. But they rightfully got their asses whooped. Like, move on. You know, we moved on. Nobody cared. Justice was served. So, <laughs> but we can't have that, right? All right, so something we talked about was um, the way the last drunk, or last drunk explained was the way kind of the world power or power flows. So um, prior to prior to uh, I'd even say it's definitely before the industrial revolution um your your victorian area that kind of kind of that pre-industrial victorian in that area up until that point the way of the world was you had the you had the biggest armies you had the best weapons you had the best tactics you had the best siege equipment you got to make the rules of the world you had the most power but when America started to flourish and really come in its own, we changed the rules of that. We changed the rules of the world. Now, sure, wars still break out, and even to this day, wars break out. But the major powers, for the most part, don't fight each other. Instead, they get into measuring contests of whose economy is the best. Why is that? Well, during that time it became kind of pointless to field large, large um, amounts of army, or large fields of, of armies, because it didn't matter. You know, the one thing that people don't realize is during the Civil War, the thing that won it for the Union was two things. The industrialization of the Union versus the rural um, and more humble um, Southern Army, and also um, just straight up a war of attrition. They got their supplies there and their troops there and just ramrodded victory no matter what. And the Southern military couldn't do shit about it. And that was the major victory. That's the big reason why the Union won. They could get their troops and people where they needed, when they needed, and they could be well supplied. They wouldn't be running low on rations, near bleeding out for their their wounded or sick troops dying off in the weeds, and you know their their soldiers could get the medicine, the bandages to keep on fighting, and the supplies and ammunition to keep fighting. They were their strength and spirits were up because they got regular rations. You know every little bloody thing that a well oiled industrial machine does and it whooped the shit out of them it whooped the south after they had started making massive victories it almost pushed all the way to dc it almost you know pushed all the way to and and, and almost got a an early victory you know they won quite a few battles and then grant's like you know what flood them with troops do it Get more supplies and troops on the rail cars. We're going to cut them off. We're going to keep flooding them with bodies until we turn them back. And they did. But we still have an awesome fucking military. We actually have a very overpowered military. You see, our reaction to the Cold War was we were looking at threats like China and um, Russia. And we saw them as these forces or as these militaries in which could field and massive armies you know some say in the millions each you know and if not or you know tens or way way more than they ever should right i mean that's the problem when you're an authoritarian communist socialist regime is you know your your dictator goes hey you random peasant take gun and go fight americans you know and that's what happens so you could have a massive army and we got and we responded to that that potential 
we created cluster bombs, bunker busters, you know, fuel air bombs, uh, Moabs, and and uh, you know, Apache attack attack helicopters and A ten Warthogs. Some of the best bloody pieces of of military machinery that could wipe out battalions. You know, with just you know, some simple deployment. MLRS. Hey, guess what? Everything in that grid square, done. Deleted. You know, thermobaric bombs. We're going to drop this bomb at a cave entrance. Everything has been powdered in that cave. Nothing's alive. So... Even our personal equipment, everything is meant to maximize the effectiveness of one soldier. But yet we don't abuse, you know, our OP military force. Now some say, yeah, we evolve ourselves into war, um, into foreign wars and many other different foreign interventions and so on and so forth. And that is actually a topic for another time, but I do agree. And there's an interesting line we have to tread when we are thinking about America as a world security force. Should we be a world security force? Well, that's actually going to be on uh, on the next uh, second round. So um, we'll have to uh, we'll have to wait till next Tuesday, and I promise I'll get it out on actually Tuesday to find out. Um, but we also feed. And provide aid, um, and then that does include parcels of food, more than most of the countries in the world combined. There's a reason why, you know, the Midwest is considered the breadbasket of America. We literally produce the most grain goods for the world. It's, it's hands down. And the amount of money that we send out in foreign aid and supplies we send out in foreign aid, it's, it's not even close we help so many bloody people. It, 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 it's, it's, it really is not, not, not even close. <clears throat> but we also um, actually have freedoms. And this is something touched on. Um, I probably got a couple of them wrong because I was a little, eh, but, um, but yeah, you know, we got the First Amendment. The right to free speech, press, assembly, petition the government for for a redress of grievances. That is something that no other country in the world has. I mean, you can petition your government. It may end very badly for you in most countries, or they can tell you to fuck off, you know? The freedom of speech and the freedom of the press, I mean, these are things that are alien concepts in every single country. All other countries have some sort of restriction on speech or the right to assemble or the press or all, all of those. Now, there's obviously the right to bear arms. We enshrine the right to defend yourselves against all, all, um, in, in, all potential threats, whether they be foreign, domestic, whether they be governmental in nature, or just a common thug on the street. The Third Amendment, quartering troops. I mean, this is not such a big thing anymore, but that used to be back in the day. They used to say, hey, guess what? You have to hold a troop, or you have to uh, feed and, and clothe and take care of this soldier, you know? I mean, nowadays we think of that as, as something honorable, but back then it, it was kind of something that was hoisted upon, um, upon people, especially when they really couldn't afford to, back in the days where you're struggling, where you could barely feed yourself. Um, Fourth Amendment, right of search and seizure. This is what I was talking about when I was like, yeah, it would be a lot easier. We could catch people if, you know, we could just sh steal their shit. And then go, well, there you go. There's the cocaine. We just had to illegally knock down your door to get it, you know. But honestly, um, but yeah, it's, it's you know, the, the, the this protection is so important. Um, double jeopardy, self-incrimination, um, the right to jury, the right to confront and to counsel. You know, there's no secret trials. There shouldn't be, you know, common lawsuits and jury trial. Um, 
excess bail or fines, cruel and unusual punishment, uh, so and and so on, right? So that's what I'm getting at is that we are one of the few who actually per- enshrines and protects those those rights and actually give a crap enough to do so. Last thing. This is going to be a short one. Um, so, future hostilities, what this basically was, is somebody was like, oh, what if there was a Hunger Games scenario? Or what if we did met combat to settle all grievances? Well, here's the problem, right? So, the future hostilities are going to come down to one thing. When it comes to um, the trial by met combat or whatever um, people wanted, uh, whatever, you know, was talked about, I can only exist... In an authoritarian world. And honestly, it would have to be enforced by absolute force. Meaning, you would have a standing military ready to go at all times when somebody was like, you know what? We lost that video game confronta- or that competition. So, guess what? We're still invading there. That they can come and put the fucking hammer down on them. And it would have to be not just... Warfare, <clears throat> but absolute brutality to set an example. To really push home, you don't want to fuck with us. Um, and these honestly would be meaningless games for resolution that would basically be used to distract the populace or to empower those who are already in power. Um, so... The idea of a free people, when it comes to resolving our differences in a uh, republic, is we talk it out. We hash it out. And only as a last resort do we ever get out the musket and fight. And that's usually only if lives are at stake in a republic. You know? So... That's kind of that's kind of that breakdown. And I think that's why I favor the free people system over the cool anarchic uh, dystopian future of video gaming determining or mech battles or gladiatorial future gladiatorial combat dictating the way future hostilities are negotiated. <laughs> that's just me though. All right, thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate the views. If you like what you saw, go ahead and give me a follow if you are on Twitch. And if you are on the YouTubins, give me a like and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. Um, Yeah, and tomorrow we're going to be doing a drunk sprawl. Uh, Dang, I think I already am drunk. (laughs) But we're going to be doing drunk playing. So... Come check us out then. It'll be 8.30, as always. And y'all have a good one. Thanks.